Right, um, now we're going to have a stage filled with the, the veterans of this event because you've seen them on all the other stages. I'm not sure everybody's ready yet. Do people want to sit down or people need to chat? Is everybody ready? Yeah? I think we're also going to have a walk workshop um, for people who don't fully get concepts here because I've been explaining, you know, how to mint the NFTs, how to, you know, um, post moments and do other things. But we're also going to have a NFT dominatrix workshop for all these people who un don't understand. Okay. But now, please welcome to the stage um, Manuel Zuru, who's going to be moder moderator. Simona? No, Simona didn't come. Uh, Evan. What's up? Oh, I'm Evan McMullen Evan, from Disco. Sorry. I am Simona for today. And Nada. Nada is here, fantastic. Scott. Elko. And Andy. All right. Look, finally, you have them all in one place. And I'll have to remind you once again that you can actually catch them after the talk and uh, scan their code. What you need to do, you have to go on the website, which is going to be here um, at the ETH Barcelona. I think we're going to show it in a second. And the thing is that you can get those NFTs from them. And what you can do, you can actually fulfill your dreams. You can get the ticket for the next event. You can get a T-shirt and even a tote bag, okay? So it's really worth it. Look, look at that. There's top five speakers, top collectors, and but you don't worry, you can still join the race and, you know, be one of these lucky people. And okay, I think now we can start talking about public goods. Take it away, Mano. Good luck. Wait, is this the sound? Is it working? Yeah, it's working. I think it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Do I have sound? I haven't given my NFT to anybody, and I will only give one to somebody who haven't taken an NFT from anyone. <laughs> Come be a loser with me. Clean provenance. Clean provenance. All right. Um, first of all, thanks all of you for being here. Um, today, we got, we're just going to have a little conversation about what public goods are and so on. So first, let's start with the definition of public goods. Who wants to start? I give it to Scott. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard question to start with. I think, you know, what I talked about yesterday was the idea that the non-excludable, non-rivalrous definition of public goods is kind of antiquated and actually started with sort of this 1950s history from Paul Samuelson that was actually aimed at sort of partly removing the public from conversation, trying to push people towards the idea that private goods were actually the area of focus that people should be kind of thinking about. And I think the sort of notion that I like to think about when I think about public goods is positive externalities and creating positive externalities via some kind of collective action. So if you have a transit network, for example, that transit network, not, it doesn't just benefit people who you know, take the train, it benefits people who are all around that sort of area. Um, similarly, at the university or any educational institution doesn't just benefit the students, it benefits the entire society. Those kinds of positive externalities to me are at the heart of what we sort of are talking about when we talk about public goods. And I think it captures a broader sort of scope of things that we care about when we are actually like thinking of this concept. The probably like seminal work on public goods that I, I didn't talk about yesterday is probably John Dewey's The Public and Its Problems um, from like 1927. That book is, is I think much more in line with this philosophy and surprisingly is, is not really brought up a lot in like modern discourse around the subject. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, to see that resurge, to see that be part of the conversation and, Web3 as we define public goods. What about you, Andy? Well, I was always inspired by the work at the other internet. Uh, this notion that the other internet, first of all, is just people. Uh, and that matches our own kind of definition that layer zero has always been the people. It's not Humans. really about uh, technology as an end, but rather a means to an end, and that being more time spent together, right? Like if our technology doesn't give us the ability to conspire, which literally means to breathe, right? Like if we're not getting more time just to breathe together, that's probably an indication that whatever we're building for, whether it's public, private, or club, it's not really uh, good. 
And the way that they have defined it, which has always really struck a note with me, is that a public good, broadly speaking, outside of some of the more academic uh, literature that Scott has very beautifully pointed at, is one in which others' benefit is axiomatic. So we begin with benefit for others. And that is a revolutionary starting point because so much of the way that we are conditioned, so much of the manner in which we experience technology, i.e. me alone in front of my screen doing something, is primarily about me, mine, what I own, how I benefit, the way I experience the world. And if instead the conversation is framed in terms of who are the others with whom I'm interacting and how do the things that I am building, the ways in which I am relating and the manner in which I choose to describe this stuff, benefiting them first. That seems like a very interesting place to start, particularly when we're thinking about what does programmable money actually mean, because it's not about programming flows of value to me, it's about programming flows of value through me to the people that I care about. Amen to that. Um, to me, it sounds like kind of like an ego death in one way, right? Like, um, <laughs> um, I, I'd love to hear from you, Evan. Um, how can we incentivize people to create public goods? How can we create um, ways that you know, people feel encouraged and motivated to support public goods? That is a beautiful question. What is it about our shared experience that inspires us to contribute to the whole? So public goods are really a function of identity, of shared identity, a shared understanding of what is valuable, a shared ability to contribute and to participate. Um, so in, you know, in instances of, uh, of failures in public goods or where inadequate public goods or inadequate resources are dedicated to public goods, often this is a function of fractured identity. So an identity coordination problem leads to insufficient investment in public goods. What we can do here, what we can uh, inspire in each other in this room, in the communities where we live, is a stronger sense of shared identity, of collective participation, addressing that coordination problem um, so that we can all feel a shared sense of ownership. Um, it's also very you know, exciting uh, that in instances where individuals feel a sense of identity related to the public goods that they are investing in, that they're contributing to, um, that it's not really a rivalrous experience, meaning I don't really care how much you're contributing or whether you get more than me, whether I get more than you, if we together share this identity, this act of contributing to one another, to our communities, and simply vibing with our friends and contributing to the whole is gonna be really awesome motivation. It is going to affect the way that I think about myself as a person and how I see my role in our community, how I value myself. It's also going to help me connect with others in a manner that is so much more exponentially powerful than what I could have done alone. Yeah, 100%. I think identity for sure is one piece of the puzzle that is super, super needed. And I know uh, Gitcoin and many other different tools are trying to prove that humanity, uh, prove that there's a real human behind the decisions that we're making and so on. Um, and with this call as well, like how um, how basically can we use like all the different uh, aspects of us and, and how can we relate to each other? Um, for you, Nader, um, you that, that uh, founded uh, Developer DAO and is, is, is open for people to come, um, I wonder how, how was the, how is the reception of people when they're contributing something that might not generate monetary value immediately. I think the whole focus of Developer DAO was kind of to create educational resources and places for people to be able to like learn and land roles and essentially like make money without having to, I would say, you know, go the traditional route. So everything that we do is really focused on being able to be public and free for people outside of the of the DAO. Because with the DAO, the way that we see them kind of act today for the most part, there's some sort of token gating mechanism. So therefore you're kind of excluding like a decent amount of people. And also to kind of create some um, civil resistance, you have to have a way to kind of gate in some way a, a 
core number of people that are working together and coordinating together, um, but still being able to create value. So what we you know, basically try to do is create free educational resources, free events, um, free you know, talks and workshops and all types of stuff where you don't have to be part of a DAO to, to come and join. You can essentially just you know, follow us on Twitter and find out all the things that are happening. Um, but if you're in the DAO, you do get a lot more you know, benefits. We've had dozens of people land really you know, high quality jobs, life changing types of scenarios and things like that. So um, we're still trying to figure it out, but I think that the, the focus is like, we want to make it to where you don't have to be part of the DAO to be able to benefit from all of the work that's happening within there. But if you uh, do join, that you also get additional benefits, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, and I believe that education and culture are somehow, to me, super, super important when, you, when we talk about public goods. Um, because thanks to that is that first we're coming together, we're collaborating, each of us is building a piece of the puzzle that we're putting together, right? And um, I'd love to know from you, Felipe, uh, what are the different ways to actually fund public goods um, from your perspective? Okay. <clears throat> well, that is the, the part of the, the biggest part of the challenge, right? Considering that a public good is something that within its own unfolding, the benefit, what defines a public good in the simplest sentence, if you had to explain to a kid in a favela in Brazil without the uh, academic referencing, is basically something w of which the benefit cannot be gated, right? So it's, it's there and everybody benefits because it exists. Therefore, it's kind of vulnerable to all kinds of attacks. Um, we gave them names, we have the free rider problem, we have broken window theory, we have uh, uh, tragedy of the commons, things like this. So the way to fund it, one of the aspects of what she was talking about, which is kind of the contrary of ego death, which is the uh, elevation of social status through participation in the funding of that thing with a percentage of your abundance, which I don't think there's anything wrong about it, as long as you don't start gating and then gaining influence and control over the management of that commons. But a lot of it has become available now that we have shared uh, ledger technology that reverts the prisoner's dilemma and we can all see what everybody's doing. Uh, foundational part of that puzzle, how the puzzle has been the work of Gitcoin. Um, what I've been trying to do, funding a cultural educational commons in which we're in, in very fruitful conversations with developer now they wanna become sponsors, is looking at connective spaces that lie in between the, all the organizational identities. So creating something that doesn't have a power project and is co-funded by all that benefit from it through hard conversations, right? So you need somebody like you, like me, who arrives and says, look, here's how you benefit it. Here's what we need. So I think direct asking and framing and narrative, strong narrative of what the value is and things like this. Um, so, so far, we've still needed um, people in vocational state that want to defend that comes. We are making headway into fixing that, and maybe there is a temperature state that can be reached in terms of social viscosity of that system that fixes that once and for all, like going forward. Um, but we need to design that path for when something becomes so ubiquitously recognized as a public good that needs to be defended, like Wikipedia or something, that journey is still a somewhat lonely journey of strong believers. And I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in that life. So I wish I had a more shiny, green, interesting answer for your question. Yeah. But I think, I think it comes through vocational strong understanding that is your time to put your immediate um, benefit in a sec time. on a shelf and then take that journey for a set amount of time. If you're in the audience going through something similar, try to define your limits, then do that, and do that really well, and then make sure you offboard it to somebody else, and you're already punk as fuck. Solar, lunar, eclipse, uh, underground, fucking grass punk, I don't know, you choose your flavor of punk. As long as you get to punk, punk it up, and I'll punk with you. <laughs> All right, um, so yeah, basically you said that a weight of funding public goods, in your case, has been 
uh, you know, finding sponsors, finding people that are interested about your cause and what you believe in. So basically supporting you at the philanthropic level or altruistic level, or maybe it's because they're getting a benefit, which might be exposure, which might be, uh, you know, being able to benefit, as you say, to be part of the, of the place that you're putting together and so on. Um, there are more tools out there. Um, you built one. Um, you did token curator registries. Um, is there any way that we can use token curator registries uh, for incentivizing people to contribute to public goods? Sure. So there are a few things I want to pick up on in answering this because it is uh, such a fascinating context that has been laid across the <laughs> stage here, right? And, and one of the most interesting things, particularly about Evan's work that I adore, uh, is that this notion of shared identity, which is so critical to public goods, their funding, the narratives that are told around them, the mythos in which they're whole, held, is that one of the beautiful aspects is that a shared identity doesn't preclude diversity. In fact, it requires it, right? That one of the critical aspects of our work here is to recognize that there is shared purpose and narrative vehicle in some degree that all of us agree to hop onto and parade into the next place. But that doesn't mean we all have to believe the same things, identify in the same ways, subscribe to the same exact descriptions of what a good is, what a public is, and how they might interoperate. Recognizing this, we can come to understand that this other internet question of like, it's not just what are public goods, what are private goods, what are club goods, how does the spectrum operate? It's what is good for the public, <laughs> right? Like, like what truly gets us together in ways which are healthy, convivial, which appeal to our own vernaculars, which allow us to live well together. And when we're asking those kinds of questions, we can then go to the builders, right? And Nader's work is, in fact, what allowed me to do a lot of the work that I did, because I learned so much from the content that he's put together, literally in and of itself, an enormously impactful public good that has resonance in ways which are difficult for him to predict. <laughs> and, you know, he ends up on a panel with some random guy from Africa being like, hey, dude, thanks so much. <laughs> like, the work that you did was enormously helpful. And the reason that it's enormously helpful is because it allows me to think very, very differently about what the term make money actually means. Right? Because we have this conditioned ideal that like, when I learn something and then go and do a job, it's somebody else that like, gives me money. And that, that, like, that, that's what making money means. But we have the ability to Selling your time. actually make money. Literally, like that's what programmable ledgers allow you do, to do. They allow you to make your own money, right? And so there are any number of ways in which you can think creatively about like this problem of funding when you think about what programmable money actually means. And what I said earlier about like it's not about programming the value to flow to me, but when I think about how I can program the flow of value in society through me in such a way that others benefit is axiomatic, I can think about commons in a way that is radically different, right? Because the old notion of commons, and in particular if you read like Michael Polanyi or even Illich or some of these older thinkers, the commons was a place so rich in custom and so complex in its interactions that it couldn't be reduced to law. It's not that it was this like lawless place. It's just that the oak tree that existed in the village was used by so many different people in so many different ways that it wasn't reducible to the enclosed nature of English law that then came once the lords had decided, look, we can't let the peasants run around and do exactly what they want. The reason that I bring that up is because like token curated registries yield earning vaults, collateralized debt positions, all of these primitives are the building blocks we can use to think about similarly complex interactions which allow us to have open, unenclosed commons that are not defined by one specific rule, right? So like in a very, very practical way, like this registry that you're referring to that I built is uh, like <laughs> very, very simply, the idea is when people come through kernel and do a course, you can pay $100 for the course 
that $100 gets locked in a yield-bearing vault, you can claim the $100 back at the end. So there's no debt, there's no student loans, there's none of the current problems that we currently see in education. You can walk away with exactly what you put in at the end. But similarly speaking, when at the end of the course you can choose, instead of claiming that $100 back, to take the $100 and the yield that you've earned to mint learn tokens, to join an epistemic community of people that are interested in pursuing ongoing lifelong learning. The way that those tokens are minted into existence is, again, very, very simple. It says that the more collateral that is locked in the contract, the less learn gets minted per collateral added. So you have a linearly increasing price curve. But this is one of many different curves, right? It's not like this is the way you should do it. It's just one, one potential tool. that makes it clear, programmable, verifiable, public, and transparent that if you enter into this particular game, these are the rules by which we play. This is the kind of commons that we're interested in fostering and cultivating. But it's one of many. It's uh, diversity. There are, there, it, it ought to be a world in which many worlds fit. 100%. Right? So there are multiple tools, right? Like quadratic funding, uh, the use of token curated registries, and maybe you have some incentive rewards to the people that participate in the, in the curation process. Um, you might have conviction voting, and you know, you're selecting like, the different causes that are going to be receiving uh, some funds. Uh, is there any other one that we might have not mentioned yet? Or maybe you, the public, you guys have any one that we haven't mentioned? I would maybe say retroactive public goods funding is certainly one area of exploration here. And I think it's almost um, its own sort of meta category of, of funding kind of as a mechanism, because you're either funding things as you go based on your expectation of sort of their benefit to the world, or as is often you know, not the case in open source software, you're trying to give value back based on the value that is being given um, to the community, to the public. And I think there's a need to think through both of those mechanisms, both kind of giving people the sort of initial funding to start any kind of commons that they might want, but there's also the need to think through how do you actually give them value proportionate to what they've created. And I think this idea of, as Andy was saying, with creating money is really about creating currencies that first align with our values and that then can be used in that sense in sort of also, you know, the, the sort of illage sense, which I think is beautiful in the concept of the tree and sort of the, the multiple uses of these, these tools, you can start to define both of those mechanisms, both kind of, kind of pre-funding and then like retroactive funding into the way that those commons function. And that's fundamentally interesting in the concept of uh, open source software in particular, because unlike other forms of commons, it's, it's generative. The more open source software that you create, the better off everyone is, and actually the more that people can, can create with it. Whereas typically in a commons, at least in the Ostrom sense, you have the problem of, you know, well, in theory, the problem that people will need some set of baseline rules, which, which do often get established, of course, that was what she won the Nobel Prize for in, in 2009. Like that idea of uh, sort of, you know, creating rules that then set the boundary on the fishery or set the limits as, as Felipe mentioned. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I think both those mechanisms are important. And uh, yeah. retroactive public goods funding, I would say, is definitely one of the ones that's less explored, but is primed for exploration. Yeah, I agree. Um, however, I've been hearing a lot of critic, uh, a lot of criticism um, when it comes to the retro retroactive <coughs> public funding. Why? It's because imagine that you have um, a lot of people that are trying to build something, right? They're not collaborating between them, right? They're not working together. And each of them, they're hoping that they're going to be retroactively rewarded. Um, and that I personally believe that that's, that could be an issue, yes. right? Yeah. That could be an issue because they're not working together, yeah. right? They're not coming together. But there's another problem, which I heard in uh, Twitter space the other day, which I found really, really uh, mind-blowing the way that they said it. Uh, it was uh, that it seems kind of like some sort of... Um, slavery in a way. And I was pretty shocked when I heard that. Why? Uh, because it's like people are going to be working, yeah, I can, I can. working towards... Yeah, well, well, some, wait. Just somebody just who's an artist yes. is 
uh, uh, and design. Can I, can I finish one second? Uh, so like people are going to be like working towards something, right? But they don't really know if they're going to be, be, if they're going to be rewarded at the end or not. So it's like they're in like in this weird situation. Yeah. So maybe there has to be some middle ground. Maybe you have, uh, you have to give an initial incentive and then I don't know. Uh, it can't be the primary means. It can't, exactly. It that's what I wanted to, to that, get to. Yeah, like right? that's the big piece. And I think yeah, the, what like, I was going to yeah. bring is like, it's very common practice in the advertising world to send out a briefing to several agencies and they all create spec work to try to compete for that one job. And I grew up in a family. My mom was an advertiser and I've, I've seen her go through endless nights of trying to get the gig. I don't think that's what necessarily from a Web3 context uh, retroactive funding means. And that's what Andy brought that you can have this on-chain signifier that tracks the interactions. And then you can decide how that retroactive funding actually disperses through the tracked interactions. And it doesn't necessarily is a winner take all kind of design. There's many Got other uh, sophisticated ways for us to, to, to bring it, but still the criticism exists yeah, yeah. As of, because I think as a South American people, both of us kind of get our hairs on end because in the end, maybe the most innovative or most challenger or most um, critically needed um, idea need, is the one that actually needs a extra speck of, of belief and support. So. Retroactive funding works from a system that's already in a relatively abundant state, but many of the people who could actually be contributing the most are not in the space, even psychologically, where they could actually embark, even allow themselves to embark in that journey. Independently of how much abundance they actually have, it's also a mindset issue. So this is something that we can actually address um, as educators and stewards in the crypto space, and I think I'm talking to you and talking to you. And, and not only that, it's also, uh, it's also a privilege. We're privileged as fuck, right? Like if you're able to contribute to a public good, you have to be privileged. And we need to accept that. We need to know that we are privileged, right? Uh, there's people that don't have money at all to buy their food, and they're, they're locked in this <clears throat> mindset of, you know, uh, working towards just putting food on the table. Yeah, right? so the point that I was so trying to make is that that definitely exists, but I also know a fat share, and sorry, I'm gonna make fun of Americans for a second. I know a fat share of Americans who have a personal net worth of higher than half a million to a million, or several million, who still won't give themselves permission of embarking on that type of abundance mindset. So even independent yeah, of how much money it's you not actually about the, hold, it's, not about, it's right? an issue of identity, of um, narrative, narratives of success, right? So the whole Taoist, the Taoist, by the way, because everybody tries to find Taoist.co, no, it's the, because it's the person that matters. It's not the Tao, it's the Taoist. Cool, so the whole premise is it's a research collective for um, collective su success narratives, right? So the big shift that we need to actually make available for individuals to create collective successes is that winning alone is bad, right? Got it, yeah. So, we always give the Oscar to the director, to the singer, to the... But it's always, a team behind. Yeah, There's so we always forget the wife, the team, the children, the inspiration, the pastor of the community, the facilitators that get forgotten, the polarity managers that are doing works that are undiscretizable. They, don't, they, they cannot be fenced. They're just managing polarities. They get forgotten. I've been, so yeah, so basically my appeal is like, there's a lot of people like me who have been doing this work undercover. And because there was a cool brand that made it visible, now I can talk about it on stage. But there's many others that are sustaining polarities and you can't really fence that work. So how do you pay for work that can't be fenced? Yeah, this is what comes back, just very quickly, like the one thing I'll notice, like you have to have all these things come back to a commons. They can't come back to an individual. They can't come back to, you know, the, the like captain of the team sort of in that analogy. Like I think you need to have it come back to a common group and that commons is like the critical thing for us to actually define. In the Web3 context, we're lucky that we sort of have like Ethereum as a commons or we have these different kind of groupings that we can work within. But I think in other sort of communities, it's much ch more challenging to think through, like how do you ensure that gets distributed fairly in that, in that context? But the one thing I wanna to touch on very quickly in the context of ensuring open source software, or just any kind of work is paid up front I think the challenge historically has been, you know, folks like Richard Stallman famously kind of talk about the idea that open source software should be free. Everyone has sort of the mindset that they should be working for free. 
And I think it's actually a narrative, like a mindset shift that needs to happen for people to kind of demand that they are paid for that work. Um, and yeah. that that happens, you know, I still think retroactively, like, uh, you know, in addition, but certainly like yeah, yeah. to start, but sorry, Evan. Um, so, oh no, no, I think this is this is wonderful, Eden. And so, um, sort of to that end, and Solidity is an amazing tool because it allows developers to pay themselves, um, but to you know address all of the proofs of non-financial work that go into allowing these projects to happen, allowing individuals to take the four, allowing movements to occur. Um, in Web three, we right now don't have a way to capture those proofs of non-financial work. We are leveraging a very brutish system of doc public documentation, and the methods of participation that we measure require an insane amount of technical literacy to mm -hmm. participate, require, as you note, a remarkable amount of, you know, in some cases, free time and resources yes. or the mindset to free one's resources to participate. And so as long as we are talking about only public goods that interact with the chain, we will be extraordinarily limited in our ability to express, recognize contribution, and to form a shared identity that is built around more than our technical aptitude and money. Is it, I'm, I'm sorry now that, is Ethereum a public good? I mean, any protocol that offers public data, publicly accessible infrastructure could be a public good depending on the use case for that person. So I think that one of the things that I like the most about Web3 is this idea of like taking the, the ideology of open source software and applying it to actual data and infrastructure. So if I build a, a back end in the traditional world, it's limited to only me because only, only I can access it, but it's also brittle and I can change it. So if anyone else is using my API, I can basically uh, close them off. Similar to how Twitter had a really great API, people were using it for years. People started building applications that made more money or were taking money away, I guess, from Twitter's advertising. So they shut that API off. With Web3, you can't do that. With these decentralized, like um, I guess, immutable protocols, hyperstructures. I think I saw Zora write about that. Right. You can't, you can't do anything. So if I build something, I deploy it. As long as the network exists, the data exists, and the infrastructure exists, so I can just build out a new front end on top of someone else's work, and it's free for me to use and access. So. Okay, uh, one, one thing that I heard uh, during launch um, is that maybe things that you need to pay for, maybe they're not necessarily a public good. Um, so, okay, we can- You don't have to pay to, to read though, you only have to pay correct. to actually, yeah. Yes, you're, you're totally right. But what about clubs? What about like things that are branded as public good, <laughs> but in reality you have to pay to be part of that club. Can I, can I try uh, to just grab that for two seconds before we move on? Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. The problem here is an issue with language. It's, it's the language, issue, yeah. The issue of thingness. Ethereum is not a thing. A good is not a thing. Language is just a, a systemic need of consciousness, but there are aspects of a thing that are public, and there are aspects that are not public. Your actions in interacting with the good can make it clubby or private or public. Okay. So there's definitely indiscussable aspects of Ethereum that are a public good. Trying to define the whole thing as not one or the other might be a, a, a interesting debate. <laughs> it is uh, a debate. Debate for sure. club fun thing to do. But yeah. it won't, like, it won't, we won't end it. We're just going to find yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's not get into that debate for sure. <laughs> um, okay, for, for you, Evan, uh, what happens in these? let's say, open spaces that are, we consider, consider them public goods that do have a token, and the, tokens, the price of the token goes down, how do we keep that, you know, how, that, how do we keep that momentum? How do we keep that people really motivated when it comes, uh, when it comes to continue to contribute? Because I think what it did, what to me at least is identity. <laughs> Why? Because you're still contributing, you're still building, you're still, and that no one can take it away. I love this question because my preference is always to not put it in a token, to keep the proofs of your work that you cannot give away to others, the experiences and achievements that you have that cannot be sold should not be captured in a form that can be lost, that can be sold, that can be stolen that can depreciate in value because the fact that you wrote that newsletter is not worth 50% less now. That newsletter had sick alpha and it was great and it still is. <laughs> and so in communities that are experiencing strife because of their token price, I invite us to ask, what is the reason for our gathering? Is it 
to fetishize the mechanism of payment that brings us all together? Or is it you know, a set of principles and objectives that we came here to solve for which this token and its associated mechanism was merely a measuring stick? And you know, an aspect of, uh, of quantification because we had no other way. Um, so you know, in, this, uh, in this exciting moment in our market, I think um, one way that we can invite greater intrinsic motivation is to lean on identity, as we were talking yeah. about earlier to create um, documentation of one's contributions, participation, impacts uh, in a form that is not fungible because your contributions are not fungible. Um, I would also say that if, you know, if, if we are interested in thinking about a very important public good, there are incredible stewards here from the World Wide Web Consortium who volunteer their time to keep the internet running. And as of last Thursday, introduced a new identifier method, the newest since URLs, such that Web3 might interact at a protocol layer with the existing infrastructure that we have. Cool. Um, so as we think about public goods funding, let us remember that this has been around for quite a long time. Indeed, this particular group since 1994, helping us keep the internet running. So as we think about our solutions and the different ways we can approach these things, um, we are part of a much greater ecosystem with deep needs for digital infrastructure and public goods funding. Any of you has an answer to that question? How do we keep? Yeah, I'm a big fan of the simplest answer, which is separating um, like pay work for uh, pay for work and influence, right? <clears throat> so usually, because there's an assumption here, there's two assumptions. One, that you get a token that is both financial and power related, and that you care about the token because it's relative dollar or whatever currency price. Mm -hmm. Those assumptions are not necessities, right? Um, if I am, let's say I work for Metafactory, I have a huge amount of robot tokens. I can be sad that it's 90% down, but actually if what it means to me is having a robot and not dollars becomes a non-issue. But then the other thing that I really like is just paying people a dollar salary or hour rate or whatever measuring stick you want, and also have the token that represents stewardship, power, influence, reputation, or whatever you want to call it. Um, the problem with the well, don't we want to <clears throat> go outside of the dollar and outside of those currencies? Well, when you're worried about the token price, you literally didn't. Correct. So, so that so that means that we're still thinking. Right, exactly. uh, in what is so I, keeping us trapped. I play a right? game. I play a game of more Ethereum in my wallet. That's my game. I play <laughs> that game. I'm happy as a puppy right now. You're all sad, and I'm like, no, it's too too expensive. Like macro, like a war, like everything's going. But to that's shit. a terrible problem to have because if if everything <laughs> succeeds, then it, it's a, it basically blocks almost 95% or more of the world from interacting because like yeah. if the token goes up, that's not a good thing unless the protocol is built in a way Pretty that much. wants to yeah. take that into consideration. So a transaction but should if we be build subsidizable to where we cannot free. gate. Yeah, if we build public goods that are ungatable, it's not blocking anybody. Well, um, one, one area that I think that we haven't even seen at all. It's one of the most powerful things that is a result of the internet is social graphs. We have trillion dollar companies that have extracted so much yeah. value and money from people. And all of that money is going to public bads, if you would call yeah. them. Um, <laughs> these companies are doing terrible things. And I think that what we're starting to see with Lens Protocol, that was the first actual implementation of a public uh, open source. And you, know, you can fork it or you can use it, an actual real world social graph that can enable us to take these billions of dollars and let uh, uh, take the middleman out, which would be Facebook and the advertisers, and let people interact with each other. And also maybe take, it, like, when I say take the advertisers out, obviously there is actual some, you know, something there for people to be able to market things. But what if we could instead, I could connect directly with someone that is on Lens, and I could pay them the money. They could talk about whatever they want. Uh, let's say that the Lens launches a token at some point. That token becomes valuable within the network. As long as they have some mechanism in place to keep that uh, value low, I think that's going to be the next big source of public gets funding in the next I, few I years. think so too. We don't have to take out the advertisers. If we control the revenue together and we have a legitimately consensus agreed profit share model, that's a huge leap forward. Like you literally, okay, go, go, go. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, but how can we re generate revenue without compromising our ethos and without compromising why we're here? I, I think that just goes back to the commons question, right? Like <laughs> we, so first of all, I think the really important kind of takeaway from this conversation is that you need to separate identity from money. Like those two things should not be kind of in tandem, and that's like I think where the token issue comes into play. 
I think that the notion that we can totally abstract money and not have any sort of financialization of the system is the kind of idealism, unfortunately, that led to a lot of the problems that necessitated Web3 in the first place. So I think for me, like, there's a degree of, you know, kind of getting and trying to prevent hyper-financialization, mm -hmm. but there's also an element of trying to make sure that we are using the financial value that we create to give back to a commons rather than to individuals or rather, you know, especially then giving back to public bads or like some large scale corporation that would otherwise just kind of capture that, that value. To me, the ultimate sort of end of Web3 is that you have all these different commons network together and sharing in their success together. And you can do that, you know, PrimeDAO, for example, is doing a lot of good work on like mm. these concepts of uh, token swaps between projects. There's so, sort of like these concepts of finding ways to align incentives between different, different commons. And then you get all these sort of like even hyper local commons that eventually kind of bundle up to being full scale, like global commons. And like when you look at, you know, the, the folks who were working on these standards in 1994, like they weren't really getting a, a lot of substantial even recognition or pay both identity and money like for that work. And they were largely responsible for the reason we're on this stage today. Yeah. And I think that's like a huge problem that we have kind of let slide for like 20, 30 years that, you know, we're, we're not always going to be perfect in solving, but we're in making incremental progress towards. 100%. Uh, a friend of mine, Mitch, uh, told me today, more tokens, more problems. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to quote you at this on stage. Uh, you want to uh, you you be careful, though, because the, like, again, if we, if we go back to the thing, what is actually good for the public, right? It allows us to think more broadly about, for instance, the free rider problem. Mm. When we have systems in which we can make our own money, then the narrative need not be one of free riders, but these are a public whom we ought to be serving. And when we're in that kind of mindset, then we can see that like tokens play a critical role in collusion prevention. That is what they're really good at, right? They teach the word itself. It's tachen. It comes from the Germanic or the Dutch root, which means to teach or to transmit information about facts and values. And what these things transmit is what we define collusion to be in the system. When we're in that place where we're saying, okay, this is what collusion is, we can think more broadly about, look, there's no such thing as a free rider because we know as people of privilege and abundance that when you ride on the work of others, you damage yourself, right? You, like, you have to know that deeply first to recognize that when people are extracting value from your system, the, the galaxy brain move is not exclusion and ostracization, it's compassion. Invite yes, more. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. like, that's the place like where we need to be. If you really want to talk about like, how do you imagine complex commons from the hyper local to the yeah. global where we can use tokens in healthy ways, but not fetishize payments. Thank you so yeah. much. What I, like what that I would like phrase to... is beautiful and it's perfectly payments. expressed. So thank you very much. So to see tokens as language other than currency. Maybe one of the curses, the side, the true psyops was, is when the word crypto and the word currency became one together. Because tokens are almost like a diagnostic tool for social venal interaction. And when we do learn how to read the chain in a way that's visible and human readable and create cybernetic uh, governance possibilities, we are going to become like a third order cybernetic society that is seeing itself, seeing itself, and we're going to be able to make collective choices for possibly the first time. Yep. Uh, well. We ran out of time. However, uh, I want to make a last question. How do we measure what we believe is making impact? What are the different tools? No uh, and I'm making this question is because what you believe impact is, what you okay. believe impact is, might be completely different from what I believe impact <laughs> is. So I think that first we need to come together, decide what that impact we believe in, Right? But then how do we measure it? Any of you have I'm any question? Or we, leave, or we leave the stage like this? I have this. nothing to say. I, leave, I, I, I think people. Yeah, there's a lot to say about this. I, I think it's, it's probably going to take a long time to go through. <laughs> the two KPIs that we care about at Disco that I think also pertain to public goods are the addition of delight, value, and joy, and the removal of friction and agony. And if the net for our public is not super positive, Shut it all down. 
Yeah, to, imagine, me, to how me, how me we imagine? say we say that it's all about love. It's all about neurotransmitters. I don't know. So, so there's I'll a lot to talk about this. Let's have an interview of coordination junkies. <laughs> I'm so happy to there's, meet you, man. I made a book with you three years ago. <laughs> no. We have never seen each other in person. Awesome. All right, this is yeah. really fun, I, but I feel like I, we should wrap it up. I think that's yeah. probably <laughs> the right the right answer to leave it on. You're fucking like the one thing I'll say is everything starts local. You start with impact locally. You make an impact to your local community, and you propagate that outwards. I think effective altruism ran into this exact problem where they tried to basically solve, you know, everything at the maximal possible scale to start. And of course, like, I think there's a lot of relevant pushback to that movement today. But I think Evan's quote is the right takeaway for this, this topic. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Let's please remember that there's a quadratic uh, voting happening until next Friday and all the different impact uh, DAOs and impact projects uh, will be able to participate there. And all of you that have an NF ticket are going to be able to participate there. So go vote for all these different projects. And we're going to have, actually, the Ethereum Foundation uh, presenting and telling us a little bit about uh, that. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Giacomo uh, from Ethereum Foundation Privacy and Scaling Exploration Team. And I'm just here to make you aware about the quadratic funding round which is taking place here at Ethereum Barcelona. So first of all, let me introduce the Privacy and Scaling Exploration Team. So it's a team which is an EF-backed team started in 2019. We have about 50 people collaborative team with the wind. There will like developers, designers, full stack engineers, cryptographers, and so on. We are trying to bridge the gap between uh, cryptographic research in Ethereum and Ethereum application development. And we work mainly on primitives, gadgets for privacy and scaling, also developer tool and user facing applications for people who is willing to build the next big thing on those kind of stuff. So as many of you have heard from the super great panel before, QF is a more democratic way for communities to decide how to allocate funds for public goods. A pool of matching fund uh, is distributed among recipient projects according to a formula that takes into account both how many people value something and the strength of the individual preferences. So for the QF round here in Barcelona, QFI, the quadratic funding infrastructure built upon Macy, a minimal anti-collusion infrastructure is going to be used. So Macy is basically a set of smart contract and zero knowledge circuits upon which developer could build collusion resistant applications. So the benefit of using Macy is that it makes it impossible for you to prove how you have voted. So you cannot be trustlessly bribed. And just because the briber can never uh, understand what's going on on chain. So QFI was born out of the fact that, okay, we have this super awesome tool, which is Macy, and we want to get extract impact from Macy and make people um, run quadratic funding rounds in an easy way. So we have built QFI, and in our quadratic funding vision, we envision that um, we'd like to run a lot of um, quadratic funding rounds. So people like the Ethereum community in Barcelona will take our tools and run their QF rounds in an easy way and make you interact with it. So how does it work? So this QFI at it Barcelona is working that there, if until yesterday, there were the possibility to register your project. 
Uh, now the um, project submission is closed, and the voting will start soon, later today or maybe tomorrow morning. And yeah, basically everyone here is eligible to vote because you have both the ticket for Ethereum Barcelona. So you will receive an email with your Macy private key to cast your vote. And how does it work? So the workflow is that you navigate on qf.itbarcelona.com. Uh, you connect your wallet, the one that you have used to buy the ticket. And after that, you select, you navigate through the projects which are listed. There will be more than 20 projects. You select the ones you prefer. You cast your vote quadratically. So more votes mean more strong uh, in, is your preference. And then you cast your vote, inserting also your Macy private key. Uh, the matching pool will be distributed um, based on your votes. And yeah, there's, there are 10K allocated from EF, 10K from status, and the 5% from ticket selling at EAT Barcelona. So basically, uh, no one from the EAT Barcelona team will ask you about your Macy private key, obviously, or through social media channels. So be aware from scam tactics. Also, uh, an important note is you will be uh, airdropped with some Matic for the vote because everything will run on layer two on uh, um, Polygon. And yeah, if you, <laughs> sorry, <clears throat> if you wanna learn something more about QFI, Macy or other projects from PSE, or you have any questions about the round, uh, just feel free to come to our booth, PSE, and feel free to ask questions, thanks. Thank you.